This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Stick around to hear more about the discount that they're providing to the entire upper echelon community. Okay, it's a bit early. I had planned this video, I think for the 18th actually, but now felt like the proper time and I've learned all that I need to know about this game. So here it is. A complete and comprehensive review of New World from the perspective of someone who has advanced to Endgame, participated in nearly every single aspect of gameplay the title has to offer, and has also watched diligently as it transformed from a stumbling preview into a worldwide MMO phenomenon. This review is not going to be short. It might actually be the longest one in the channel's entire history because there is a lot to say. For the sake of organization, I'm going to break it down into four separate parts with a conclusion at the end. And those four parts will be Launch Window, containing a detailed description of how this game exploded onto the market and why it might just as quickly burn out in the aftermath. PvE as Part 2, General Leveling, Expeditions, Landmarks, and Open World Player vs. Enemy content. Crafting as Number 3, Various different skills, I've not maxed out all of them, far from it, but I've done my fair share now over my 200 plus hours in-game since release. I'll probably also throw my economy rant in there as well. And PvP as number 4, with a splash of server politics on the side for that one. This part will cover open world PvP, instanced PvP wars, general conflict, and a bit of my own anecdotal experiences thrown in, with a splash of completely game-breaking bugs that undermine the entire premise of fair combat in a game predicated on player versus player territory control mechanics. Overall, I hope this will be a somewhat informative and eye-opening look at what New World really is from the perspective of someone who has both hundreds of hours in-game and access to numerous people who play it in a much more casual way. Without further ado, let's get started. New World is a player-driven, massive open-world game from Amazon Studios, where three factions simultaneously vie for control of an unexplored continent. The truth is, that continent has been explored dozens of times over by alpha, beta, and preview testers, so in reality, in actual reality, there is very little in the way of new information to be gleaned. And some of the central pillars of enjoyment that a nostalgic game like classic World of Warcraft managed to cultivate back in the day, all those years ago, are actually impossible for this title. For better or for worse, New World released on September 28th of 2021 to an existing database of information that creates a sort of paradoxical comedy in its name. It's a new world, but it's not new at all. Even so, some of the content was unexplored and hordes of players piled into the game on release day, which puts us at the launch day portion of this review. Even though launch day is really launch week of sorts, and the ramifications of this failure will ripple outwards for many weeks to come, maybe even months into the future. Launch day for New World, in no uncertain terms, at least when specifically referring to player population metrics, was incredibly successful. Nearly a million concurrent players piled into the servers, and things probably could not have gone better from a publicity perspective. However, publicity be damned, there were problems on the horizon. Amazon had designed a system where character names were global, and they had also decided to implement a rolling release window. That meant that hundreds of thousands of players began piling into European servers when they opened there was nowhere for them to actually go. The reason for this is quite simple. New World was capped at 2,000 concurrent players per server, and at one point, there were more people in the login queue than could actually physically enter the game. That was not a snapshot moment in time. That was hours, by the way, and the issues of login queues on certain servers persisted for days. That's a problem, and Amazon obviously responded to it, but their response only made things worse. Instead of working on server capacity increases, they opened brand new servers with a promise of free transfers later on. This alleviated some of the pressure, to be sure, but also created an entirely new problem, because a game that focuses on three-way faction combat and isolated character economies needs to maintain a critical mass of active players per server, or those servers die. As I write this script, hundreds of servers have fallen into a state of near limbo, as their economies falter and their population dies out. That means core pillars of the game cease to function in a healthy way, and those players are now effectively stranded. In tandem to all this though, as if it wasn't enough already, Amazon decided to halt new character creations on certain high population servers, to allow existing players more access. In theory, that might seem good, but since the entire economy was constructed like a pseudo-resource pyramid, with low-tier resources making up the integral bottom layer, this created a glut in the higher-tier level resource economy, which on some servers caused further discomfort for nearly every type of player. As it stands, Amazon's ultimate approach to this issue, from transfers to merges to whatever else, remains somewhat unknown. As I script this, there is no cohesive public plan. There is no communicated roadmap or anything of the sort, just a vague assertion that it's coming down the line, and an atmosphere of anticipation from a large number of players who are trapped on servers without their friends, quarantined to servers that are all but deceased, or stuck in regions with suboptimal ping. I would summarize New World's launch window as a double-edged sword, where one section of the player base saw a seemingly polished game, I say seemingly with extreme precision here, 
and the other couldn't get in, or had their launch window utterly destroyed by Amazon's knee-jerk reactions. That might be a meaningless issue for some or even most of you watching this right now, take it for what you will, but a game like New World only has one launch window. The game will only ever go live once in its lifespan, and that can hold a lot of weight for certain players. The exception, perhaps, would be a title like Classic WoW, but even then, the argument can be made that the nostalgia of leveling and learning in an unknown world is utterly destroyed by the years upon years of meta-evolution and archived information. New World's launch window was a stable, productive, and enjoyable experience for some, while it was a disconnect-ridden headache for others. When one player was in for six straight hours leveling their skills and having a wonderful time, another was stuck in queue for four hours only to get ejected from that queue and forced to restart at position 42. There is no one-size-fits-all here, which concludes my analysis of the launch window, because how these decisions will ultimately affect the game's longevity remains to be seen. I would speculate that they will have a decidedly negative impact, but that is, after all, simply my own speculation, so take it with a grain of salt. Now though, it's time for today's video sponsor, and that sponsor is Skillshare. Skillshare is a massive and growing online learning community teaching a wide array of classes, and in a world dominated by online abusive advertising, which is often predatory, especially on social media, they offer a premium ad-free experience to their users. More recently, I've been trying to learn website development because revamping the upper echelon website is going to be a critical step in the growth of the channel overall. Skillshare has classes for nearly everything, and one course in particular, hand coding your first website, HTML and CSS basics by Rich Armstrong, was extremely valuable as I tried to establish a foundation for that skill set. Skillshare is built for all levels of talent from amateur to professional, and on top of that, when you join, you can try out a Skillshare live class which provides a whole new dynamic for online classes. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link down below in the description as a special offer will get a one month completely free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring right now today. Again, the link down below will give the first 1,000 users a one month free trial so they can explore the site at their leisure. Big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring the channel. All right, next up is PVE. Generally speaking, PVE content in New World is functional and rather fun. You are able to allocate skill points to a series of thresholds that dictate individual stat boosts and choose from a decent selection of weapons that range in concept from magical to physical and ranged. The combat is action-oriented, meaning that you do not have a tab-targeting skill rotation, and player skill, individual, personal skill, absolutely plays a part here in a pretty large number of fights. The game has come a long way. In the preview, nearly every single encounter was a variation of left-click spam, with broken mechanics, i.e. the hatchet, or whatever broken weapon was in that particular testing phase. And here, now, at full release, there is much more in the way of mechanical diversity and combat tactics. Example. In the background right now is an endgame dungeon where communication is absolutely required, because rudimentary mechanics like distance from group members and avoidance of an instant wipe are key to the party's success. It's not revolutionary, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it's functional. It feels well-crafted, and it allows for a player with better reflexes, as an example, better aim or better overall strategy, to excel beyond their peers in a way that rewards dedication, innovation, and coordinated gameplay. When it comes to balancing, the game has a very simplistic system. Yellow numbers with up arrows mean the enemy is weak to your damage, blue numbers with down arrows mean they will resist it, and white numbers are neutral. This system is, admittedly, quite shallow, but with a series of slottable gems which give general damage conversion, it allows players to begin constructing dedicated sets of armor for specific enemy archetypes and tasks. Want to be a healer? You can do it. Want to switch and be a tank? It might require some gold to switch all of those skill attributes, etc., and some time to level your skills as well as a new set of gear, especially to keep in your stash or in your inventory, but you can do that too. And this type of freedom dramatically increases the longevity of any title out there by allowing people to build on what they have already done with the same character. Obviously not all expeditions, which are just dungeons with a different name, like companies or guilds, they just wanted to be different, not all expeditions are equal. Some are less demanding, some more so, but they have managed to strike a very good balance of level and relative difficulty. Your first expedition, as an example, will have very few demanding tasks aside from maybe a boss's raw strength at the end, while your fourth one, at a much higher level, will require a significant more amount of communication about what enemy to kill and when. Again, to reiterate, nothing they have done at all in totality in this entire game is revolutionary in any capacity whatsoever, or even top of its class at all, not even close. But it's all functional, and some of it plays quite well. Outside of expeditions are open world dungeons, quests, and general PvE content. For quests, I'll make this part very short because that's all it deserves. 
There is a rudimentary story that you probably won't give a single shit about. There is lore for those that want it, but generally speaking, it's nothing but a beige coat of paint on a bedroom wall. You wanted something there, but you don't really care what it is. When you max out a weapon's skill, you get a long quest chain for a legendary version of that weapon in the northern regions, which is pretty cool and feels like an adequate way to reward players for their time. But when it comes to overall questing, it's a tool to get you through levels with kill, fetch, and order completion objectives. Nothing more, nothing less. Fun fact, in the game's menu, you can look at certain information about level unlocks for specific quests, which ties back into how you level up your personal camp, for example, which makes it worthwhile to look at these quests, most of them, but a lot of them are region-specific, give crappy rewards, and really just fill the void between level 1 and level 60. Not much more than that. Now, open-world dungeons, that's where there's some fun to be had. This game was originally intended to be purely open world, actually, and a lot of these dungeons are clearly left over from that time. That's how the preview was. They contain gold bar elites, high level enemies, some fun bosses to fight, and extremely good loot. These will be a great way for your party to break up the monotony of other content and general leveling. I highly suggest doing them on curve as you level. Fun, decently rewarding, and deserving of your time. However, in certain regions, the spawn rates are completely fucked up. Some bosses spawn every 30 minutes, some spawn every 3 minutes. Some are required for quests as you compete for kill credit with far too many players all at once, all around you, while others remain off the beaten path forever, because reasons, I guess. These dungeons provide quality loot, but once you outlevel them, there is literally never a reason to return. So you could easily miss them, and in doing so, miss quite a few well-crafted areas that would otherwise spice up your leveling experience. I would suggest maybe not ignoring all of them in favor of the most optimal routes, but maybe that's just me in hindsight. Last up for general PvE before the capstone is the Corruption, which will probably become a main source of experience, gear, and other rewards for the more streamlined player base. Corruption is very simple. Once you get to a certain point in the main story, you get an Azoth staff. That staff lets you close rifts. I call them rifts out of habit, and I guess others call them breaches. And you can close major or minor breaches to your heart's content. Except, except, one key factor here, not all of the breaches can be closed. They are glitched. Many of the high tier, we stopped at, I think, four consecutive rifts in Shattered Mountain, as one example, and multiple of the lower tier rifts can be battled, defeated, and laid bare. But when you go to close them with an adequate staff, and all the requirements are met, it just doesn't let you. This is doubly frustrating when it is realized that the greater rifts in the northern region were, at least previously, tied into a key fragment system, which granted access to a Spriggan arena. Is it in the game? I don't know. Are all of the rifts broken? I don't know. But enough of them are to where farming the higher level corruption is a disjointed, broken process, and it's supremely unenjoyable. Even when you can farm these corruption rifts, the process rapidly gets boring, but in all fairness, it's another thing to do, and it interacts with the ultimate corruption mechanic, which is invasions. And also, a lot of the time, you're going to end up zerging these with like 40 people. It's a clusterfuck, and it's not really enjoyable. Invasions are effectively the game's raid. Invasions are 50-man corrupted PvE horde mode for half an hour in whatever territory it happens to attack. These are difficult, at least right now, before people metagame the shit out of them, and cause crafting tables or fort defenses to get knocked down if you lose. More on those things later on. At the moment, most people are going to lose, and that's okay. They give good rewards, they require communication, and they are, most importantly, fun. But what isn't fun is the company dynamics at play in the background. This game has an incredibly toxic community. You can spam that downvote button all you want on this video because you feel personally attacked by that statement, but that is an immutable truth that will only get more and more apparent with time. There are a lot of disgustingly toxic, brutally elitist people in this game who now, through deliberate game mechanics, control the fate of every war and every invasion that has ever and will ever occur. When an invasion is declared, the governing company in that region decided through PvP wars, and trust me, I'll cover that one soon, the governing faction can slot 10 players of their choice and then kick or ban everyone else from the war in an effort to ensure that only their friends or the highest levels get in and fill those other 40 slots. It should be noted, you do have to be level 50 to even sign up, which makes sense based on the relative difficulty. This allows them to completely control who is in the event by removing everyone else from the list. By itself, that might actually be fine if it was a system built right into the core framework of the game, but as it stands, it's very clearly designed in a way where that isn't supposed to be happening, else the governor would be able to select all 50 participants, not just 10. It's a contradictory system where companies will constantly kick anyone who they don't want until the list is composed in a certain specific way so that only their own allies are involved. 
I understand why they do it. I actually agree it's probably better for that type of control to be implemented anyways, because these wars require communication and coordination, but as it stands, the system makes no sense. If I had to summarize, I would say that PvE is a mostly successful, bland, but fun creation where players, especially casual ones, will enjoy it a great deal. Gear progression post-60 becomes a constant grind for chests and respawning bosses, which is now apparently resulting in player bans according to the subreddit, where certain boss farming spots are now met with temporary suspensions for cheating if you farm them too much, but that's an area where I have zero personal experience, so take it for what you will. Plus an entire mechanical interaction with crafting that is brutally incompetent, to say the very least, but overall, generally speaking, PvE at its most foundational level is fun to play. This brings us to crafting and skilling. Crafting and skilling in New World is a complete and utter failure. That might seem surprising because many other reviewers out there right now will be absolutely fawning over the crafting system, but I cannot rightly sit here and pretend it is anything other than a fucking embarrassment. First off, certain skills, like skinning as an example, can be trained from 70 to 200 in like an hour. There's a spot with corrupted hounds near Fort Ramos and Cutlass Keys for the hardcore group that knows what those are, where you can abuse the idiotic spawn rates and farm like... I think 800 or so experience per skin on like a few second respawn timer with maybe 10 of them accessible. That's not even the only way either because kills will give literally thousands or more experience per skin at a certain point and the scaling just isn't there or it's broken. Meanwhile, harvesting requires hours upon hours upon hours of running in circles finding specific static herb or plant spawns and even then it won't be maxed out. A skill like cooking is incredibly easy to level, achieving 180 plus in a very short time span, while a skill like engineering or furnishing will require tens, even hundreds of thousands of resources that put you in a vice-like grip, where a massive amount of capital, resource funneling, or grinding is required, that, to be completely honest, might be totally impossible for someone to even do solo within the span of months, if they don't grind every single day. There are guides emerging that help solve these problems, kind of, by finding the most efficient avenue for those particular seemingly broken skills, but some of the balancing is colossally fucked up. For instance, the rarity on certain necessary ingredients for Arcana, as a personal example, are easy to get for the first levels, then hard to get, then incredibly rare for the tier 4 potions, I think tier 4 potions, but then stupidly easy again for the tier 5, which is counterintuitive. There are segments that feel well balanced, intersecting with other segments for even the exact same skill, that feel ridiculous and absurd. In tandem, there are numerous smaller issues as well, such as a default mechanic for the listed ingredients. In many professions, you can use a multitude of separate item options for a recipe that seems to prioritize, at times, the most rare component you have. I myself never fell prey to this, but it's almost like the system was designed to use the most elusive ingredients first and default to the much more common, cheaper, easier to acquire resources afterwards. That has, and will, undoubtedly cause otherwise completely avoidable frustration for a lot of crafters. It's bad design, and there's no reason for it. Another one? Well, Faction Gear, which is a logical progression into 60 content when you get maximum reputation, which is a very easy feat, by the way, has different variations for stat rolls that can actually be adjusted. That's a great thing, but some of the mechanics are actually bugged or don't yet exist in-game. The Cleric suffix for the Covenant Faction, as an example, doesn't work on Inquisitor Gear. That might be a small cross-section of players who get affected, but when you grind over 100,000 tokens and can't actually re-roll the stats that you want, despite having the listed item claiming you can do that re-roll, it's frustrating. There was someone in my own core group who had a similar issue and simply couldn't augment his armor with the desired stat re-roll at a certain crafting station, despite every other version of the item working. I don't remember specifics, but it's an issue some people will encounter after grinding tens of thousands of tokens over the span of hours. Again, not big by itself, but it's one of many. Now, here's the part where people will say, well, it's supposed to be your grind, and yes, you're right. But why is it that some skills can take minutes to level, while others take weeks? These being similar skills in the production or refining categories. Why is it that many of those skills have potholes and broken features that disrupt and degrade the overall experience, and how could that possibly be beneficial for the game? But, before devolving too quickly into a rant about crafting balance, let's talk about something even more egregious. Let's say you want to level Arcana, like I did, that you want to craft some of the cool items, like I and so many others did, do, and will continue to want. Well, that legendary item, which requires, shall we say, quill bark to craft, a tier 4 epic component from certain high-level trees, yeah, it's not in the game. It doesn't drop. Quill bark, among others, there are more, doesn't drop right now. There has never been a single one on the entire global server market. There are Reddit threads where people document dozens of hours logging with full luck gear and not getting a single drop, and this quite literally makes a not-so-small number of schematics and crafted items impossible to make. 
That is embarrassing, unacceptable, idiotic, and shameful for this game when you remember that it is produced by Amazon and has been delayed for over a year for the purpose of polishing. Wanna go fishing? This doesn't matter as much now because the horrendous queue issues are over, leaving dozens of dead servers in their wake, but this probably hit hard at launch. Wanna fish? Yeah, while actively fishing, you can be booted for being AFK, and that is just the start of what's broken here. The crafting system feels good and looks good for the first half of your experience, but MMOs need endgame, and one of the integral components for endgame in New World is expeditions. Here's the problem. To do the high-level expeditions, you are required to have a tuning orb. That tuning orb, at least the real endgame ones, is on a daily timer for a set number to be produced, and requires an extremely high stone-cutting level to actually make it. Bear with me, that sounds fine, but wait until you learn that tuning orbs are bind on pickup which means you can't trade them. That means a crafter who wants to make them can't sell them, can't trade them, can't do anything but maybe sell themselves to a squad and go physically queue the dungeon just to leave the group. Functional, sure, but idiotic and poorly planned, especially for those who aren't grinding every aspect of this game and maybe want to remain as a dedicated crafter, ungeared and under max level. The alternative is that every single group of players who wants to run endgame content has to have a nearly maxed out stone cutter in their party, which is fine if someone you know wants to do that, but if not, you are basically finding workarounds for their shitty systems all the time. Oh, and some of the stuff you want to craft, you can't, because the items don't exist right now in the game. That leads me, logically, to the economy, because let's say you could sell those orbs in a reasonable way. Well, if you hypothetically could sell them, you would still be subjected to one of the most fundamentally dysfunctional economies in all of gaming. Because every single region, of which there are many, has its own isolated storage and economy. By itself, that might seem trivial. Yeah, obviously you can't just magic your items to other cities from storage in the world. The game is realistic. But think about it for a second. Even if this provides for a chance at arbitrage, running or teleporting items to and from different locations for profit, it becomes a delinquent, irritating slog when you realize that Azoth, the resource used for teleporting around the map, is incredibly quick to spend, you also spend it for any sort of special crafting, and relatively slow to acquire. That means that items you list might not sell in one region, while they could in another, or you have materials here that you need there because of crafting table levels, which is an even deeper wormhole of tedium. And ultimately, for reasons often outside of your control, you will need to teleport all around the map to actually craft things or deliver things or go places with an Azoth cap that makes it an absolute undeniable pain in the ass. This could be fine, maybe, if territory was remaining somewhat steady, but it isn't. Territory changes hands all the time, which affects Azoth prices. And I'll explain just how broken that actually is in a second here. Plus the corrupted invasions, which means all the materials you have in Everfall might suddenly be useless because their crafting tables got downgraded, and you have to get them to some other region. If your faction controls that region, you can pay gold to get them there, or you can do it yourself, which turns the economy from an interesting concept into a constant, unending grind of tedium as you juggle items from here to there, buying, selling, teleporting, readjusting, transporting, and more. The best part, your stash in every single city has a maximum weight capacity attached to it, because that makes sense. So as you approach true endgame, you are going to literally run out of storage space in a lot of these locations and just be reduced to managing your inventory for stupid amounts of time if you even have the patience for it. Speaking to the idea of economy pricing, this game is horrifically botched in almost every conceivable way right now from an economic perspective. Here's a basic summary. Since everyone wants to level skills, logically, of course, but there are no vendors at all, everything must be peer traded or sold or salvaged, but that gives basically nothing, only repair parts and a tiny fragment of gold. So not a lot of people are doing that with the better items, even though that's probably what they should be doing because that's the only alternative. Anyways, that means people start to try and recoup costs for their crafted items and begin undercutting each other. That's a very slippery slope. Why? Because people are then willing to sell items that cost, let's say 4,000 gold to make for less than half that price. And the cost just keeps on falling. There is a bit of consolidation around a central auction house, usually, in a lot of servers it's Everfall, but just because of a central location, it could be others in different worlds, but yeah, there's a bit of consolidation. But you have to get all of your items to that central area, running headfirst into the Azoth wall, while also tangling with the stash capacity weight limit. Even if you have your house and you have chests in your house, it still is not that much capacity when you think about the sheer volume required for certain professions. Basically, the economy is completely unequivocally fucked right now, and people who simply want, I don't know, 10% of their sunk cost back 
are bombarding the listing prices with huge undercuts, thereby creating a race to the bottom. You can buy certain metal ingots, as one example, for a fraction of the price it actually costs to make them with other materials. That's an upside-down economy, and it's headed into the dirt. Adding this in postscript, there's actually a very important function to NPC vendors. They set a price floor. That means if something is selling in an auction house in almost every other MMORPG out there, it can be bought if it descends below that certain threshold where you can buy it from the auction house and turn a profit selling it to a vendor. Having no vendors at all removes that floor, and there actually isn't anywhere, there's no safety net, there's no, there's no bottom to catch this. It's just going to keep falling, well not necessarily always, like maybe it'll equalize, but not having those NPC vendors, like not having that kind of stability, that intrinsic stability in the economy, is leading to something extremely volatile, which is not really pleasant for anyone involved right now. To really try and expand on that, what you're doing is you're putting up items in certain auction houses that are all isolated, and you're having to pay a significant fee, and if the company governing you is are assholes, then you're paying a significantly higher fee to auction these items and try and get something from them, but then everybody is constantly undercutting you, which means it falls within minutes half the time, and then you can't sell it, right? So it's so volatile that you're wasting so much money trying to list items that never sell, and if you try and do it for 14 days, that function is just completely useless. So it's it's hard to explain, like, in one cohesive breath, especially post-script without, like, my notes in front of me, just how broken this economy is, but it is totally dysfunctional. It just, it is absolutely off the rails. All in all, crafting has great moments and some really cool payoffs when you finally make something worthwhile and produce meaningful resources for your company, like those tuning orbs, but it somehow manages to feel disjointed and unfinished. Couple that with an economy that makes power leveling or even comfortably supplementing resources for the casual player a total nightmare, and you have something that manages to feel great at first until it rapidly devolves later on. If you happen to pick a profession that is much more balanced and don't even touch the broken ones till later, that's great, they will probably fix them eventually, but as it stands, I have to say that crafting is a complete mess, and that this particular reality has yet to dawn on quite a few people I see who are currently praising the game. Now though, we arrive at PvP. Instanced, open world, and playlist, which is a stinking, festering shit stain on the face of New World. I'll skip the playlist part and say that it's actually disabled right now, at least on our server, because it's broken. People were getting stuck and couldn't load in. I have no idea what the situation actually looks like on that, but with half a million players and plenty of time for a portion of that audience to hit 60 so far, even when it was enabled, matches were very rarely being fulfilled on hardly any server. It seems like a fine addition to the game, but for my purposes, and the experiences of many, it's meaningless right now. The most important form of PvP is the instanced wars. Why is that? Well, simply put, that's how you claim or defend your territory, which allows you to control what crafting tables get upgraded, what the taxes are, and also give a myriad of other bonuses, which I don't really need to go over, but they do exist. These wars are 50 versus 50. One side has a fort, the defender, and the other is attacking it. The whole thing is point defense, and when you take three control points plus the keep, you win the war. If you don't take them in the span of 30 minutes, you lose the attack, the defender retains control. This, like most other things in New World, is good in theory. It's actually very fun the first couple of times, but it totally falls apart in practice. Here is where I need to play some clips. One of these is from the attacker, the other is from the defender. After it's done, I'll explain what the entire foundation of this game's territory control and PvP really is, but for the moment, just, just have a look. Front of the point, put them between the fort and us, not behind us. Get AOEs, AOEs, AOEs. Yo, look at All the enemy AOEs. team, they're stuck, they can't AOEs. even attack. Flex team, focus B, focus B. We need turrets, we need siege cannons on B. Forest team, uh, take out that siege. Hop on turret. Bodies on, on, dude. This lag is gonna, yeah. yeah. This is fucking terrible. 
Bodies on point. They have more bodies on point than us. We have to get on point, everyone. Rose, unload. I mean, Scarlet, unload. I think those were pretty self-explanatory, but even so, let me summarize. 50 versus 50 matches, regardless of hardware, regardless of computer specs or internet connection, can be and are being, and this is spreading, it is proliferating, it is a virus that is going all throughout different servers. They can be lagged deliberately client side to allow teams in vulnerability. Somehow it just deletes the siege cannon ammo, stops the defenders from doing anything and turns the entire match into a statue-esque mannequin fight while they easily, unbeatably capture the points. This is spreading. This is a tactic that has existed since before the game came out. It was apparently corrected slightly before release, but the infrastructure in these wars is absolutely broken to such an extreme degree the PvP and territory system cannot function while it exists. The war system is a 30 minute 50 versus 50 deciding factor on how everyone will interact with that territory. That means taxes, Azoth prices, housing discounts, and more. Territory control means something, and while it may be true that the developers simply wanted to foster as much PvP as possible, it's also true that they completely botched this aspect of the game. Ignoring other issues like how the fire staff can proc apparently four to six times on an ability that should only hit once, I've only ever seen it proc three times for me, but apparently it can hit four to six frequently, because the game logs character movement and animations as separate entities during its duration or something to that effect, which also breaks PvP balance in a damaging way, Ignoring other things like that, and that's not even the only one, we can look at open world PvP and see a system that isn't much better. Open world PvP or influence is just awful. The developers have, as of the scripting of this video, adjusted the values here, but it's still fairly bad, and the underlying framework is just as broken. Open world influence comes down to spamming three identical quests over and over and over and over with a zerg to throw a territory into conflict. Once that's done, you can declare war. That part is bugged, by the way, and often doesn't work. Despite contributing basically all of the influence, this is just my personal experience, my company could not declare war because we didn't contribute enough. We had done about 95% of the bar, just to clarify that and put it in perspective. But moving on, once you successfully declare war, you attack, and if you fail, it resets. The thing is, there is a system by which territories get easier and easier to throw into conflict, based on how long they have been held by the same company. Again, in theory, that's cool. In reality, it's fucking awful. This system means that after a span of time, a single squad of people can go turn in a couple of PvP quests and throw your entire territory into conflict. A single person can go capture your fort, thereby granting the attackers bonuses, and there aren't even basic mechanics in place to require some sort of coordinated push. The game focuses so very hard on factions and companies with some of the most broken, unbalanced PvP I have ever seen in my life, and a community more toxic than any other game I have played in recent memory. The open world PvP skirmishes you will find can be great fun. They absolutely can, and I want to make note of that specifically, but they do not happen with any reliable frequency, and they do not have any real value to the game because if you push back a Zerg who is attacking your territory influence, all they need to do is wait two hours till some people log off and just do it all again where the Blitzkrieg tactics will be uncounterable. You can go to sleep and wake up one hour later with your territory in conflict and no time to do anything in defense of it. To summarize, PvP is a complete and utter mess, where the central component, instanced 50v50 wars, that's the most important aspect of this, are being brutally exploited in a way that makes the game utterly worthless and completely unworthy of playing if you care about that content in the slightest. Almost done. Last part, server politics. This is where I farm those dislikes because there are a few things that need to be said. This game has one of the worst communities I have ever seen. It is pathetic. The culture in this game has rapidly devolved so quickly, I might actually be impressed if it weren't so sad. Having discussed with about a dozen people on four separate servers, I can say with a fairly high degree of confidence, this game is dominated and will continue to be dominated in the near future by the absolute bottom of the social barrel in the gaming community. This has a number of different causal factors, and I hope some people will listen to this before they screech in the comment section. Chief among them, obviously, the ability for exploits to completely dominate the entire core PvP function. However, when you allow 50 people to decide the fate of an entire region, with total control for one person who heads that company, whatever it may be, you all but guarantee that those 50 people, at least the ones who win with any reasonable de degree of reliability, will be the ones who exploit or abuse meta mechanics the hardest. 
That means a tiny cross-section of the most hardcore players, which believe me, despite being nowhere near the best of that group, I am among them, it allows that tiny cross-section to dominate multiple different areas, both in size and mechanical scope, of the regular player base's experience, and those groups are often abusing it. Anecdotally, I can give an example from my own server. There is a company with hundreds of members called Enclave. Enclave is apparently a long-standing guild from other games, and their strategy, I fell prey to this myself, was to lie about their population, war capacity, and tactics, as their leader specifically asked if we would be willing to have a war that isn't a statuesque abuse of game-breaking exploits that totally ruined the entire underlying mode. I, foolishly, I might add, agreed wholeheartedly. Surprise, they turned, brought every single one of the highest levels they possibly could, abused the exploit openly, and took home the win. I should add, I had a lengthy conversation with their governor before the war about how these types of exploits will destroy server population, how they are not enjoyable, and how we hope to create something better than that on our server in particular. But he lied. That's on him. Immediately afterwards, one of their officers, Swole Benji on YouTube, began to lie and manipulate in-game because they, now controlling a new territory, had raised every tax to the maximum value. This is a creator with 49,000 subscribers and is the type to brag about how much he earns from YouTube while degrading minimum wage workers, harming the experience of players on his server, and lying about it in the process. Swole Benji, when you watch this, you are no one and you are nothing. Enclave is a group of players who self-proclaim themselves to be gamers, but are less than men. They are what excels in this game because other groups do not have the mental delinquency or moral flexibility to abuse those same mechanics on such an extreme, unrelenting schedule. This is a group, or rather company, composition that is replicated elsewhere, and the toxicity of this community at the apex tier of PvP competition, which intrinsically dominates the daily life of casual players, is consistently dialing up as the days go by. Now, I should be clear, this does not assume that all companies are the same. In fact, I would argue that the majority of them create lasting friendships and have an excellent culture. However, the game's fundamental PvP system, and especially its horrifically broken underlying balance, make it so that these types of groups in particular excel at taking territory, which feeds their hunger for abuse even further, in an escalating cycle of toxicity that already is, and will continue to, drive players away from this game. Furthermore, the level of control and elitism that these mega groups have, and I, I say mega groups even though we do have 200 people in upper echelon, but we've kind of structured it a bit differently than others on our server. These mega groups with three or four hundred members, they're able to control all 50 of the applicants for wars. So it's going to come down to an exclusionary process where a certain set of extremely hardcore, unbelievably elitist people are controlling the outcome of all of the territory. And trust me, going down that road ends badly. More than that, because there is more to this. Amazon has an automated ban system that seemingly processes report tickets with a formula. Groups of players have now weaponized this mechanic and are successfully getting leadership of opposing factions or companies or just people they don't like after wars that they feel victimized by, just it's spreading. They are getting people, especially leadership, banned before and after critical wars. That is, when reports are fraudulent, I should clarify that accurate reporting of leadership for blatant use of deliberate exploits to cheat in wars should be actively encouraged at this stage of the game, such as the Enclave leadership on the server Heliopolis. But when fraudulent, that is one of the more morally deficient methods one can imagine for winning a competitive fight. I'd say it's worse than the exploits and the lag and whatever else, but it's a tactic that is only picking up steam. It is growing. More and more groups are now doing this, and they target the opposing faction's best players or leadership. This type of community norm is disgusting, and it further exacerbates an emerging problem where only the worst players among us will have the moral and ethical stamina to keep up with this game. As the ranks thin out and people become apathetic to their initial time investment, thereby abandoning the title completely, it will only cause the frequency and intensity of these tactics to increase further. Even if these problems are fixed individually, the underlying structure positions the groups with this type of twisted, degenerate compass as the front runners of who will dictate policy, taxation, and overall culture moving forward. New World is a game with two faces. One face is an appealing experience where you can spend a couple hours a day or a few on the weekends and find a great deal of value or fun. If you get the right group, it can be amazing. If you enjoy a certain profession, even more so. And by the time you get to the broken aspects or the things that devolve into tedium, who knows, maybe they'll be fixed. At $40, if you want to play this game in a more laid-back type of way, and are okay with your experience most likely being dominated, at least in the short term, from a utility perspective, by exploit-driven, elitist, and sometimes abusive companies, then yes, it's worth it. 
I will say with enthusiasm that I had a lot of fun for many, many hours. But the bell cannot be unrung. When you start to feel the flaws, not just see them, feel them, experience them. When you feel those flaws, it's hard to look past. However, on the flip side, for the other face, it is a broken, unfinished, unpredictably grindy experience that rewards the worst possible meta behavior and balances entire core pillars around a framework that is fundamentally broken. It somehow managed to create an initial dynamic where the absolute bottom of the societal barrel is able to control the outcome of nearly every conflict, with far-reaching ramifications thereafter. For the more hardcore players, you will notice flaws, drastic flaws. It might still be the exact game you always wanted, thereby hooking you in long term, I'm not qualified to say, but to me, New World is merely a testament to how much people want another big MMORPG. In my opinion, the success of this game has very little to do with the quality, polish, or design of the actual product, and everything to do with raw player desire for the simple genre it inhabits. It is on a crash course for a massive player base decline, and that's not even mentioning all the potential pay-to-win mechanics. I do believe that they will start selling Azoth. I do believe that they will offer XP bonuses and catch-up mechanics and all sorts of different things. I do believe it will become pay-to-win. It isn't right now. Could be in the future. That's not really worth speculating on much more, but that whole overarching thing is looming in the background, right? So it's headed for a massive player-based decline, picking up where I left off, as glitches, exploits, and toxicity of culture reach critical mass. That spiral will negatively impact most servers. It will negatively impact the auction system, the economy, and the overall faction PvP balance to a point where huge swaths of the initial servers become ghost towns. When they merge, it will breathe life back into the title for a brief respite, only to resume the decline thereafter, as the core casual audience finishes their PvE activities or burns out their enthusiastic spark, if you will. Ultimately, the game has an identity crisis. It was built first as a PvP title, it was later repurposed to be much more favorable to PvE, but the PvP still has a massive impact on player dynamics and overall experience. Endgame content becomes much more accessible by aligning with a main faction company, but the social dynamics of play are going to be hit or miss, to say the very least. Solo play is viable, but can become tedious for a great many quest bosses and endgame objectives, so it rapidly becomes a tightrope balancing act with decisions about what you actually want to have realistic access to and what you wish to ignore. It's worth the $40, I would have a very hard time denying that, but when the honeymoon phase is over, the pavement hits hard with this game. And believe me, there's going to be pavement waiting, right there, smooth surface, cruising at your face for a lot of New World players in the near future. Rating three aspects individually, the PvE is a solid seven. It has the basics and it does them well. Nothing revolutionary, but fun. The crafting is initially an eight, but it becomes a five when you uncover the larger flaws, like missing items that render entire sections of the recipe panel just useless. The PvP is a three. Actually, more like a two and a half, which could easily become a flat two if they don't make drastic nearly immediate changes. If your focus is PvE, I can and do recommend it. It's got fun. If your focus is crafting and scaling, I'd say maybe wait for some patches, just for fundamental broken things that are underneath the surface, but maybe still worth it. And if your focus is PvP, stay the fuck away from this game unless they radically overhaul their existing system, because it's garbage. They need to fix those underlying issues. New World has two faces, one decent, the other tragically broken, and I don't understand how so many people are trying to ignore that tragically broken face. It is annoyingly awful in a lot of different ways. It took me a long time to see it, but now I do. I hope they fix it, but I really have no idea what comes next. Hope this helped. Check out the sponsor down below. No outro other than to say check out those links in the description. Have a nice night.